Street. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today the spotlight shines on Stephen Milne, singer, songwriter, keyboardist, and vocalist in the Aberdeen, Scotland-based band, The Little Kicks. The Little Kicks make sophisticated pop music, with three of the members providing vocal harmonies, songs with enticing guitar hooks, and the seductive sound of analog synthesizers. The band is still supporting their most recent record, People Need Love, which was released back in September 2022. Look for it or link to it through the show notes. Stephen gave us a wealth of insight into the mind and heart of a modern songwriter and performer. Enjoy our conversation. It's funny, I'm sure you already know this, and I gather it's somewhat intentional, but did you ever try Googling the band's name? Yeah, yeah, I have, <laughs> yeah. And it's not always that easy to find the bits that you need. <laughs> <laughs> Although it does take you down quite a fun rabbit hole, one I haven't been down in a long time. It's very funny what comes up. And I guess for the benefit of our listeners to not be coy, it's the infamous and famous Seinfeld episode of Elaine dancing. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and it actually, you know, after seeing that, that episode and knowing about it for God, it's got to be what, 25 years now. I never knew that was the name of it. So it was very funny to come across that. So you did a good public service. <laughs> yeah, good. I mean, it brings up everything from like pregnancy websites to shoe shops to, to that. So it's not maybe the best choice, but we've stuck with it and we're still going. So we'll see. Were you a Seinfeld head? Like, was that part of your, was that part of the melting pot that went into making you? Weirdly, actually, I'm, I'm probably more of a curb guy but the first drummer we ever had when we very first started was a big Seinfeld man he just threw a lot of episode like titles into like words and picked the one that we thought oh that looks quite a good band name and then actually I love Larry David and I love, love Curb but um, that's more my kind of thing although it's horrendously awkward to watch I do love it it's funny you say that because I I haven't watched I, I actually did stop watching it at one point it was like I just couldn't <laughs> I have yeah. still made my skin crawl after a while, yeah. but I do love him. I do love him. I'm probably the same. I haven't watched the last two because it's too much, but it has its moments. When it's on fire, it's amazing. But yeah, I'm the same. I, I withdraw from awkwardness sometimes. Yeah. And I, I don't know how much you've seen it or you care to pay attention here. Cheryl Hines, who played, I guess, his long-suffering wife and now ex-wife on the show, she's married to one of the more sort of fringe American presidential candidates. Oh, right. I didn't know that. I think she's in the news lately for lots of unwanted reasons. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Her husband, uh, let's say he's skeptical about science. <laughs> right. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, no. Anyway, so it's been a minute since the most recent record came out. And I wonder, what have you guys been up to in the intervening months? Like, are you on a record release tour schedule and you do that every few years or i see you've got some gigs recently what's cooking in the world of the little kicks the album came out yeah last september and we'd started it in 2019 well we'd worked on it for a long time but we essentially finished recording it before the pandemic oh basically like we were recording in glasgow about three hours from aberdeen so we we're up north of scotland from glasgow a studio called chem 19 which is Paul Savage from the Delgado's studio. And we were probably two sessions away from being finished when COVID happened. For a band like us, we do everything ourselves. We're not, we're not necessarily on the release, record release intensive schedule. It's more up to our own pace. And, you know, we all work as well as the band and have family and stuff now. So it was, let's wait until things look a bit better before we bring it out. And for us, it's the gigs that push the record. I think the record's one thing, but I think seeing the band live always helps shift the vinyl and, and other things. Like, like every band, really. And if we just drop an album on Spotify with a PR bunny behind it, it's just going to fall into the other releases, the well of other releases. So doing the gigs keeps that ball bouncing, so to speak. So the album came out. We decided to take it out in 2022 when things were much better. We did a raft of gigs across Scotland and a couple down towards the bottom of the country. And then... 
the last part of this year, we've just decided to do a handful of gigs and push them as each a big show. We've got one this week in Edinburgh coming up. We had a summer show in our hometown, make that a big deal, maximize it, move on to the next one. I think with us having family responsibilities and work responsibilities, it's easier for us to navigate that. And actually we're enjoying it more because you're not putting huge amounts of pressure on yourself to balance all that. Getting a van and gig five nights a week is not really an option for us. We did a decent tour with last autumn when the album came out of gigs back to back and again in the summer. So we're likely to do like two tours a year and probably stick to drivable distances in the UK at the moment. Although we are playing in Spain in October, that's a flyover and fly back thing. We've played gigs in Holland and Germany and stuff before. Yeah, that's, that tends to be what works for us is that kind of intense week or so when you get really tight and you go and do six or seven gigs and then we come back from that and we push it in different ways for a while and then, but it's certainly not a treadmill. There's no pressure for us, so to speak. Feels like there's still a bit of legs in the record. It came out last September and we did two or three singles beforehand. We feel like it's a strong record for singles. So there's a couple of other songs that could become singles this year before the year's out. And just keep that momentum, not maybe not momentum, but it's something we're really proud of and just keep the record out there and as best we can with the resources we have, which for an independent band is fairly limited. It's a very strong album. The songwriting is phenomenal. The playing is top notch, but it sounds, it's engineered and produced and mixed so well. It's just, it's got great sonics to it. I agree with you. It, it does sound like every song is like, wow, this could, this, like, this is a big, this is a big song. Like each one sounds so good. There's a little two minute long piano song in the middle of the record called Communicate. And that was the most sparse. The mics were pretty much right in the body of the piano as if you're in the cupboard next to the piano listening to it. And that was a, a palate cleanser for the record because it is a big record and there's lots of strings and big arrangements and lots of things going on. And I think Paul, the producer's skill really shows that you put it on, but it doesn't, I don't feel it becomes overwhelmingly jam packed. It's very well balanced and things pop in and out. And it, it's a bit of a dark art, <laughs> that production engineering thing that's way above me. I'm glad you feel that because that's how we felt about it. And when we were sharing it with people, tentatively to get what song do you think is the single there was never the same one that came back it was like oh these there was a couple that matched but what was really good was hey track eight's really strong or track nine's really strong we were like oh we hadn't thought of that one you know so it's nice to have that options rather than we've made this thing and we've only really got two four minute songs that push it so i yeah. think we've been in quite a strong position with it and we're really proud of it so it's good it may be self-evident but i would love to ask just to get your point of view is the album as a unit, is that your sense of the work of art? Or do you ever see a world in which you might think about putting songs out as you record them or become more serial in nature? Like, Have you thought about how the making and the distribution of music is changing? Or do you think in terms of albums? No, I think it's a really good question because like we're currently, I'm working on songs now with the view to like, trying to get the thought of another record, but it's really difficult to write when you box it into like an album in your head. It's trying to get away from that. So don't think about trying to write another record, try and think about just writing songs. And it's a really good point because if you try and write a record, it might take me six months to write 10 songs. That's what's happening is it's taking me quite a while because I'm setting myself some rules that I don't want to repeat from the last record and I want to make it different to the last record. But actually, if I do that, it might mean by December, I'm bored of the song I wrote in May, but that doesn't mm. mean it's not a song. Maybe it would have been better to just stick it out and get that buzz going. And we're in a position now where we actually could do that. We've got our, our drummer's very hands-on in production. And in COVID, one of the things he did was took on a rehearsal space and just got it into a studio level rehearsal space. So we could probably record ourselves now and put things out as and when, which is kind of terrifying in a way, because I quite like having that outside influence too. But I see that all the time, bands are just releasing singles constantly. And that's maybe just because of my age and my old fashionedness. I think of it like, oh, a body of work and an album is the be all and end all. Like feels frivolous to just chuck a song out on Spotify with no vinyl or no 
weight behind it. But that's actually just how music's released now. And I think I probably need to get over that, if that makes any sense. Yeah. The way you're describing it is exactly how, how things work. And it's me that needs to be dragged into the, the modern times. <laughs> I, I don't know that it's necessarily a settled issue of like, that's the way it will be now. But I do think there's interesting opportunities for experimenting with, even if the album is the ultimate work of art, the interesting thing to me that I haven't seen a lot of people experiment with yet is the order in which things come out, you know? Mm -hmm. I could imagine a world where you still did, where the album was a later collection of maybe your favorite bits over a course of time, like where the album was more curated or if you wanted to be mechanical about it, the album was the songs that the people responded the best to. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. Or not, or whatever, you know, or it was paired with art. Or I had a guest here, he made a cookbook that went with his album. And like, that was his thing. He loved cooking and he loved playing. And there's, I think it's an interesting time. But as with all these things, with social media and everything else, it puts a lot back on the artist. Because now you have to do that thinking as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Probably one of the things that holds our band back in a way, but one that also I feel like is a strength is that we don't just have one sound in a way. So our most popular song in a live setting is like a nine minute long disco thing that goes off on a bit of a tangent and has build ups and stops and stuff. And we're quite lucky that our audience seemed to, on the record that we just put out on and on into on and on. And it's a nine, nine minute long thing as well. And it's like, we have that buy-in from our audience that they seem to be music loving people that Oh, you've got a two minute piano song that's quite sad. Oh, you've got a five minute Khalid Mackie type thing, or you've got a, an eight minute long synth thing. And I think having the basis of an album gives you the canvas to be like, oh, this one's a three minute pop song. That's fine because that's great. That's what people like. Oh, I've got this six minute long moody thing. And I think if you were just writing singles, that might get shelved. But because you have an album, you can go, well, that does possibly fit here and balances the lightness of this other piece. I quite like that we've got that option in our sort of arsenal because if we had a management who were like, we just want 10 singles, you know, you, like if you watch the Lewis Capaldi documentary, he's an amazingly talented guy, whether you're into his music or not, his label are desperate for 10 of that song that made him huge. And he's got that pressure and it's horrible. It's physically horrible watching what happens to him. And it's, I couldn't go through that. I don't think someone demanding 10 number one singles would be too much and, and having the freedom to to try and write singles but also balance it with other stuff is exciting to me if that makes any sense yeah of course yeah I, I certainly don't want to be naive about it or have false nostalgia for some mythical time that may or may not have existed but it does seem that the outcomes are better rather than telling Louis Capaldi to go back and write 10 more of those songs it would be go be Lewis Capaldi 10 more times and let's see what he does next and yeah. where he goes. And, you know, trust the artist mm -hmm. to do what they do. I mean, that's how he got there in the first place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I think, and it's quite telling that in the end, they go, do you know what? We can't actually match that thing that you did. So here's something totally different, which resets the tone. And I think I'm quite old fashioned in my way, but like there's a few bands I love, like Future Islands. They just seem to drop a song every couple of months. And it's usually my wife's playing it in the kitchen. I'm like, oh, this is a new Future Island song. I didn't even know it was out. And then that, as you say, might become a record collated together. And I could totally see the model you're talking about. As a consumer, I suppose it's easier to digest than artists' back catalog if there's just three songs up there and they're all bangers. It's like, okay, these guys are, are great. But yeah, it's interesting. It is worth thinking about, I think. Something that engaged me with that model was during the pandemic, the gorillas were doing that. They were putting out a track every four or six weeks. It wasn't clear how long that was going to go on for. I'm not sure if they knew or not. They did couch it in the context of a project. Mm -hmm. But when it ultimately came out physically, the extended edition had dozens of songs. Like It was, it was actually yeah. insane. I don't know how they created that much content, but, but it was fun to go along for the ride because especially as a fan, knowing there was going to be another one, it didn't make each one have to be the most important song in the world. It was like, okay, I really like this one. Curious what the next one is. Or yeah, this one was all right, but there's going to be another one in a month. It was neat. It was fun. It was a neat ride to be on. I never thought of that point of view. That's, that's an interesting way to look at it as well. I never thought of that. For me, I think as well, it's probably to do with, like I'm in awe of, it's funny you talk about girls, because I'm in awe of Damon Albarn. I think the, the volume of output that he 
Does this is unbelievable. Like the new Blur record's brilliant. And I was listening to a lot of podcasts like this where people talk about process and he just demos all the time and has this system. And I think the difference for me is I'm probably writing so much less now that I almost feel more precious about it because I used to write so much maybe before kids came along and different responsibilities and things that you're kind of able to do, oh, there's a quick three minute song and there's something else. I find it's taking me longer to put things together. And, and for that reason, I'm probably a little bit more precious about, about them and spending a few months on a song and then uh, just sticking it up on online. I'd be like wanting to put some weight behind it. But at the same time, that's really old fashioned. And when you hear about him and the way he does it, he's just putting stuff out left, right and center. And it's getting, it's getting out there, I guess. It's really interesting where he's gotten to with his career and sort of the trust with his fans. Like it's clearly a, it's well-earned after 30 years and it's a, but it's the privilege he's got with his and this connection with his audience. Like, but I don't know how he creates that much. I mean, just mm -hmm. the physics of it makes no sense to me. It's like he, he must live three lifetimes. <laughs> it's insane. I know. I know that it comes at a cost because the new, new record's primarily about a breakup in his life, but he describes on the last thing I listened to just recording at all times and he grades it with emojis and this is where I was. And it's just, he says he writes something every day, no matter where he is. Maybe it's a sanity thing as well, if you're touring and touring and touring all the time. Yeah. And it's all good. I've not heard anything that's terrible yet from him. So yeah, it is a very amazing prolificness that he's got. Yeah. And it's not like he's a singer songwriter with a guitar churning out simple recordings. Like he's clearly well-versed with technology. He can make his songs sound well produced. It's really, yeah. you know, there's clearly effort is what I'm saying. You know, yeah. It's not just yeah. tossed off. Another artist like that, I don't know if you, if you saw his book, but Jeff Tweedy from Wilco has a book about writing one song every day. Uh, I'm like halfway through it. Isn't it? It's a, such a fun book, isn't it? It's, yeah. it? His tone is so, it's so fun. Yeah. Halfway is perhaps of being kind. I'm about a quarter of the way through it. And it's not even a big book. That's, that tells you a lot about my dedication to time to do these things. But my friend of it was like, you've got to read this book. And I'd been going on about a couple of his podcasts that I listened to. And the way he talked about his writing is amazing. But it's really fun. And it's like, I can see my friend's underlined sections within it already before he gave it to me. And it's good. It's great. Yeah. I'm sorry to, to phrase it this way, but I could almost hear his approach as almost an antidote to what you go through in terms of the struggle of making each song so important. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, the other part of it is he must just lose riffs and licks and fragments. I mean, he's creating constantly on his phone, on, on yeah. pieces of paper. Like it's, it, it is amazing. It really is an amazing practice he's developed. And unfortunately, and fortunately, he makes it seem so simple and accessible. Yeah. I feel foolish for not creating all day, every day. <laughs> I know. It's like I was listening to his Mark Maron podcast. And I've always been quite into Wilco from afar, but never been like in love with them the way people are in love with them. And I think it was just until they get to a certain age, it didn't connect as much, if that makes any sense. There's a few yeah. bands like that. And um, he just dug an acoustic guitar out and one mic on this podcast with Mark Maron bl belted out. I know what it's like from his solo record. I was like, whoa, <laughs> like that is amazing. And then I, I kind of went back through, because like, oh, I forgot I know this song, and I know this album, and then Yaki Hotel Foxtrot, and then, and now I'm like totally in the Wilco zone now, going out, because sometimes when an artist's got like so many albums, it can be daunting to know where to start, you know? Absolutely. And everyone recommends a different one. Everyone likes Summer Teeth or Blue Sky Blue, or whatever it's called, and it's like, okay, I don't know where to go here. But something that's constant is just his He's just got some character and some talent there that you can zone in on straight away. He's doing something interesting, I think. Yeah, it's great. We'll be back with more Spotlight On right after this break. Did you know that Spotlight On is completely self-funded by the team that produces it? We're always looking for ways to keep the podcast self-sufficient without sacrificing the listener experience or the integrity of the show. The best way we could think to do that was to ask for the support of our listeners. Please consider making a donation to help cover our annual operating expenses. Go to SpotlightOnPodcast.com and click the word Donate. If you can, please do. If you cannot, please don't worry about it. Just continue to enjoy the show. We're happy to have you as a listener. Thanks. 
And now, back to Spotlight On. How is your tolerance or enthusiasm for being in that van changed over <laughs> the years? You've mentioned now a couple of times about family and other responsibilities. When you're walking out the door with a packed bag and a guitar or a synth or whatever it is you're carrying under your arm, are you saying, I'm going on vacation? This is going to be great. Or are you saying, oh, not this freaking van? Ugh. I think the key to our band is that we're doing it in a way that's fun. And I think that if you did throw us in a van for six months, you would find the thing. I don't think it would fall apart, but I think it would take some of the fun out of it. And I think now that families come along, if anything, we probably appreciate it. Well, I certainly appreciate it more because when we get in the van to go and do the shows, Sometimes you've got no idea how that's going to go in the past. The excitement was driving down the road to wherever and there's 50 people there and but it could have been 300 or whatever. And you have a night out and you have a drink. We all like to have a beer or whatever. And that's fine. When we were a bit younger, the party thing was as much fun as the gig. But I do think now everyone is giving up more valuable time or time that's more limited to do it. So. If you're going to do it, the gig's got to be really good. If you're going to miss two two nights bath and bed with the kids or miss a week of, it's not just the gig, it's all the practicing and everything else. If you're going to do that, then the end result has to be really good fun and be worth it. And I think we're in a position where right now it's definitely still fun and it's definitely worth it. But I can see bands. I work as a music venue booker in my day job and I see bands come in that are knackers and i remember about seven years ago seeing a band that i really liked come in and they were just done and it was like they're just knackered and physically exhausted and you can tell that no matter how great it is they just not sure they can carry that on or want to be there anymore and i think our band is still fun and i think while it's fun they've got the buy-in from everyone to do it it's always going to be fun for me because it's I'm that little bit more invested than everyone else because it's me that's bringing the songs in. I always feel very fortunate that these three other guys are willing to like get in the van and put time and effort into the projects. Although it's an, and we're equally in the band, it's it is probably my project in terms of it's my rambling in my pajamas that we're responding to. So I feel very grateful that the older we get and the more challenges that come up with that, that they'll do that. But yeah, it is definitely still fun, but we 100%, I feel like we appreciate it more. Probably since COVID as well, because that weekly hit in the room where you're bashing a drum kit or you're thrashing a guitar and setting up where you chat to your pals is, is really actually a huge thing for men. <laughs> not not yeah. stereotype, but men don't really phone each other up and go, hey, I'm having a really crap week with the kids. Drive me insane. Let's go and talk about that for... 45 minutes but what they will do when they're hanging out is naturally talk about that side of things or family life or and then it's like you come back and you drive back and you're like oh i feel like i've released something there so the band for me is definitely a positive thing and i would like to hope that's how the other guys feel too were you able to maintain both connection with your bandmates as well as any kind of creative life through the pandemic no we were on WhatsApp and stuff. We were in touch, but I didn't write anything in the lockdown at all. I say that I have heaps of voice memos of tiny pieces of something, no, no lyrics whatsoever. Just here's a little synth bit thrown in and then kind of forgotten about, or here's a guitar bit. And I really didn't want to write about the pandemic. I was like, when, whenever this is, comes back, no one wants to be reminded of lockdown. I've called creeping into a couple of new songs lately and I'm, I'm stamping it out. Well, does it, I mean, it comes in overtly, not just mood or illusion. Yeah. Like I finished the song this week and I think it's probably about how I felt. There's a couple of lines about we're all, how everyone was in it together. Yet you found them quite alone at the same time. And I think I live out in the country about 20 minutes from the city. You couldn't go obviously without you out with your zone or whatever. And I moved into my in-laws because our house was getting done up the day before the lockdown, our house got ripped out. So I was in my in-laws with no, none of my kit, all my kit, I've got like a music space at home and all my kit was at home. And I thought it was going to be there for four weeks and then COVID happened. And I was there for five months and my venue that I worked for very thankfully survived. The company survived. It's not my company, it's the company I work for, but 
they got through it, but we all got furloughed, effectively paid a wage to go off. Yeah. And I had a second kid. I've already had a kid and then our second kid was born in January, 2020. So I just reverted into dad mode really from like May, 2020, I got furloughed. I was like, right, I'm just going to do dad stuff. And that was great. Cause it was like, you had to focus on that. And then in someone else's house, it wasn't really like I could sneak away and write a little bit here or there. I did a couple of house gigs. Actually, that kept me going. So that was something. From the Little Kicks page, we did some acoustic gigs. I'm me from home every three weeks. So I didn't overdo it. I didn't jump on every night going mad. But yeah, there was quite a few where you jump on, do an hour. And people seem to get a real buzz out of that. That was a nice thing to do to keep in touch with people, I think. In hindsight, that was probably ticking that itch to just do some gig or some performance but no not really I didn't really write anything not not start to finish anyway a few bits have you found anything has changed in you as a songwriter whether it's approach or subject matter or, or even more broadly how do you think about subject matter would you are you confessional do you play a character do you have a a mode there I definitely think if you're going to try and connect with someone then with music and the lyrics, the more open you are, the better, really. It's something I probably shied away from in the past a little bit until this last record. The songs were definitely about things, but I think that last one was particularly quite personal. And I think I tried to ramp some of it back a couple of times and kind of went, well, there's no point ramping it back. If I ramp it back, no one's going to connect with it. So I think doing it now and the, the shows we have done since it came out, there's been a handful of people come up and really connected with that and said, oh, that song's about, I've really identified with that or they've lost someone. And like, you're thinking, oh, okay, well, maybe I should keep on that thread because that's what's meaning something to someone. And if I just go in and make it really oblique, like I can't, I love the national, but I can't write like the national. And every time I try and write oblique strategy type phrases that it doesn't work for me, I think predominantly I have to write about firsthand experiences. And that's probably why I struggled in COVID because it was like, I'm not doing anything. Or I'm going to shops for the first time that week. <laughs> no one needs to hear a song about that. So <laughs> yeah, it has, it has definitely honed it in on, I'm going to try and continue to be quite open, I think. Like I was a bit terrified about it. The first time we did a BBC session over here, the guy was like prodding me on some of the themes. And I thought, oh, I don't know if I'm comfortable talking about that on the radio, but actually it was quite easy by the time it came out it was quite easy and it was like that's what people are going to dig into if you dodge that and make it sound like it's about nothing then why should people connect with it a little bit so I, I kind of learned that with the last record and then writing since COVID I suppose I've tried to feed back into that as well yeah I always find it interesting to to talk to an artist especially the writer I think of the album title people need love it's a declaration it's an affirmative statement. It's not a mashup. It's not a cut up. It's not from the oblique strategies deck. Yeah. Um, it's a very specific statement. And I wonder, why do you say that? Like, you know, what's important about saying that? I had the title before COVID. We were actually talking in the middle of COVID saying, if we carry on with that title, it makes sense because everyone was feeling pretty low. And that's what kind of held a lot of people together was love of family or friends or whatever. But I wrote that song, my dad passed about a month after my first child was born. And I was very close to my dad and my mum died when I was quite young. So suddenly this like, oh God, I'm a, I'm a father and I'm, I don't have any parents to be like, hey, what did you do when this happened? Or also like, I totally understand now why things happen a certain way. And you have this newfound respect for your parents because you're like, Oh my God, it's not easy. So that was a lot of that kind of sentiment. And I, that People Need Love song, I was dealing with that grief process probably specifically in that song. And it started off verse by verse. I don't remember laboring over it. It was just, you know, that first couple of verses. And it was going to be a little Leonard Cody interlude thing. A couple of minutes. I didn't have the People Need Love, but yeah, I just had the bit about I need you to be better than you've ever been. It was kind of me saying to my wife, I need you to prop me up here because I'm not doing so good and then the second verse is specifically about that grieving process I think and I remember I didn't drive my dad died I drive now but I had to get the bus into Aberdeen where from where I stay and just really wanted to go like home to go I was returning to work and I was like 
I just feel like I'm like the, it was just the kind of grease thing was just like bowing me over the head a little bit. And I think that thing of like, why is the world kind of carrying on when you've lost someone that means so much to you? That's the hardest thing about that process. You get quite, firstly, you're quite angry and confused. And I think I wrote that song in stages and then I needed it to peak in some way. And I had the kind of chord change lift and I needed some kind of statement and the people need love thing just came out. And I think I was probably talking about myself and my family. My family are great. I got on really well with my family, but we're not great at like probably giving each other a hug and saying to each other, are you struggling with this? Or are you? And it was an awareness that we all need a bit of love here because we're all in the same boat. I'm the oldest of three. So I was like dealing with a few things then that fell to me and I suddenly I felt like, whoa. <laughs> so, you know, that was a whole weird period, but that song's specifically really about that. And when I sent it to the guys, I was like, hey, here's an eight minute long song. Pretty obvious what it's about. If you guys aren't comfortable, I understand why this would be a bit of a Debbie Downer. You know, like here's an eight minute long song about this. And to their credit, they were like, oh, this is great. Like really love it. You've got to, you've got to work on it. And I did temper it with the Dracula. I was like, hey, here's a three minute single. Oh, and also an eight minute long song about my dad. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of how I do it. I sneak them in that process but and to their credit they were like yeah let's work on it it's really good and then they were like that thing since like sort of sums up the feel of the record so it became the title and the sort of crux of the album yeah well thank you for telling me that that's okay i'm curious about about dracula because when i first listened through the album i was interrupted about halfway through the song and then when i sat back down to resume listening I decided to go watch the video before returning to the album. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I tell you that because now my experience of the song is completely entwined in the video. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> the story, in the little narrative that runs through the video, which is great. It's such, a, it's such a nice video. But is it a literal interpretation of the song is my first question. And my second is, because I didn't pour over the lyrics, who is the Dracula in the song? What's really good about doing the video thing is you meet people who are creative and passionate and they have ideas and they get this whole different thing from your words, which is an amazing experience because sometimes they say, tell us what the song's about, and then they go off and they come back. And we've only made four or five videos in our time with that level of detail that aren't just performance clips. And they got it as this guy. So there's a bit in the song about social media and, the, and Hollywood lies and things, which I can explain. And then their video interpretation, it was this guy who's trying to break out on Instagram and whatever. And ultimately the woman comes along and frees him and says, just dance and enjoy yourself and don't worry about the stats and stuff. And that kind of feeds into like the tracks. I was on honeymoon in America. I was in Los Angeles on honeymoon. We went to LA for three days, then we went to Hawaii and then we went to San Francisco. It was amazing. Long story short, my wife, we went scuba diving in LA and my wife swallowed some of the water. She just felt like she felt horrible. So she wanted to stay in the room. And I was like, we're in LA on honeymoon. I'm not going to just sit in the hotel room. So I went for a drink in the bar and I was nursing a beer in the bar and there was this club night on and I was following a lot of things on Instagram because I wanted to be able to go back and go, oh, we were there, you know, and like ruin this on these little cool places. And I love all that Hollywood stuff about like the Chateau Marmont and all that. I love all that stuff. The Instagram for the hotel had all these women in like no clothing going, get down here now. It's so buzzing. It's jumping and there's cocktails and it was Halloween. That's what, and that's what it was. It was around about Halloween. But then they were all sitting in the lobby on their phones, bored at their minds because it was actually dead and there was no one there. And I was just sitting there like, this is the epitome of the problem with social media because they're trying to coax all these men probably down. It's jumping, you know, and then you get there and it's, there's not a soul in this, in this nightclub. And that was probably quite early. So to be fair, later on, it could have got busy. But I just thought that was a really interesting thing about Hollywood lights. It's glamorous and looking through pictures of lies. And then to make you think, oh, I wish I had that, that thing of jealousy. That's incredible. That's incredible to have witnessed that. And I, and I jotted the idea on my phone as a piece, as a thought process. And then we got this a 70 synth, the stupor synth, and it just does all the mental arpeggios and fast stabs and stuff. But separate to this, I was working on a, what if you made this really kitsch disco 
So I'm using this bit of kit that we have acquired. I have in my room that I'm in just now, I've got a lot of vintage posters on the wall just because it's beige white without them and it's really boring. It's kind of like you've got amazing pictures behind you because it's more stimulus to your thought process, I would imagine. I've got one of the Bela Lugosi Dracula advert. You know, I just put it off into film ads. So one day I was like, I'm going to make a theme tune for a really kitsch Dracula film. Like the soundtrack of that, like that was my kind of brief in my head was make this really 70s cheesy B-movie song. And then it really became more than that, but it quickly was, oh, there's actually something in this. And then and I called it Dracula. I actually called it Dracula with the K initially because my idea was it was like a ripoff and they couldn't get the rights to the real character or whatever. <laughs> and then it all came together when I remembered about that, that LA thing and that kind of... It's not just an LA thing because it's everywhere, but that's kind of what that's about is the social media disparity of trying to get people to believe lies. The verses, truth be told, are really just that thing that disco songs have where they're not necessarily that deep. I'll be honest with you on that. They're like that love and loss relationship type call and response things. The original idea for that was to have a girl that I really like from Scotland sing the second verse I really embraced that 70s thing, but then I thought that was too far. So we abandoned that and just kept it to be ourselves. But yeah, that's where that came about. But it is interesting watching the video because they picked up on some of that stuff straight away without me telling them. So it was good. Yeah, that's really neat. Are you a synthesizer head? I get the sense because it's mentioned a lot in some of the copy about the band. And uh, like, are you a gear head? Are you like, do you accumulate things? We've always had this like Juno synth we've had in our prisons, the band started. Some guy didn't know what it was, you know, that kind of thing. I think the days of that are gone, unfortunately. Yeah. Of like, Especially the Junos, it's crazy. Yeah, it's old keyboards, eBay, 200 pounds. Turns out it's a such and such, you know. I mean, that's literally happened to us twice in the last 10 years. But yeah, I'm a keyboard piano player from youth. I, I got piano and keyboard lessons and then acquired a couple of these synthesizer things. But I couldn't sit and talk to you about waves and square waves and modular stuff or build building or anything like that. I'm not like James Murphy or something. And my production skills are essentially demo level logic and layering and things like that. And I'm constant mucking about all that stuff, but I do love the hardware playing with the physical instruments. I've got the Jupiter 4 here. That was a purchase because we did a heap of BBC stuff with the 2017 record. And when the PRS came in, I in the group was like, Hey, there's this site selling a Jupiter 4. I've always wanted one. Jokingly, it was like, if you wanted to get some songs, we should get one of those. And Scott, who does our finances, was like, well, actually, if you think you're going to get 10 songs out of it, we could buy it because they don't lose any money. And we lied to ourselves and we're like, oh, we'll totally sell it. <laughs> like once we're finished with it. But no, we're not selling it. And now that he's built a studio, we've got like Jupiter 4. We've got the Juno I mentioned. We've got two MS-10 Korgs. We've got... An Omnicord. So since Damon Auburn did that clip with the Omnicord, my Omnicord's now worth a grand. It was worth 200 quid. Thanks, Damon. <laughs> yeah, I was like, thanks, mate. But what I find really good about it is there's extra options. I'm not a very talented guitar player. If you put me in a situation and said solo, I'd be totally lost. I think I'm an adequate rhythm player, but I feel like writing-wise, I would probably now start to write. On, if I was writing on guitar, I'd be repeating myself a lot because it's the same chord shapes and tricks that you've learned. Whereas with the synths, it's leave a chord running, go and play piano over it. It can sound totally different. And then I'm lucky that I've got a piano in the house and I've got the synths out here and I can just go between the two and keep working on bits. And yeah, I do love them. Like they give you an arsenal of sounds that you don't get from a guitar or a piano. But I actually tend to find the guys who know all the ins and outs of all that stuff, the songs don't tend to be so good. I think it's quite good to not have the rules, if that makes any sense. I don't know if sure. you feel like that, but... Yeah, there's something about using the tools incorrectly that, that sparks a lot of innovation or, or uh, accidents, happy accidents. Yeah, I'm a definite fraud in that you'd think by some of the stuff we've got, I would be programming and know all that stuff, but I'm more like, I'm trying to get a sound that I like and I, once I find it, I jot it down and I take a photo and things. But yeah, no, I do love them. Like the last record, I would say, not just because of the cost of it, but the Jupiter is on almost every track. And there's three tracks that wouldn't, that's maybe four that would not exist if it wasn't for it. So it's a worthwhile, and it's that thing of get someone a new toy, they'll get something out of it. 
you know? Yeah. So yeah, we are quite into that, I would say. Does it come out with you when you play or, do, or is it you recreating it all in the box? So we've got the Roland sampler pad, SPDS X, I think it's called. Scott's very, our drummer Scott's very adept at like putting these things onto the sample pad. And essentially there's four of us playing what could be a six or seven piece band easily. Wow. The thing with us is we can't tour. I mean, the Juno I've got, it, there, you'll turn it on and it'll just go, no thanks. It's so unreliable. There's one guy in Scotland who services these things, and I was down seeing him a couple of times. And he's done a great job of the things we've got. But it's like he said to me, "This is like having a vintage car. You only buy this if you are either able to fix it yourself, or you be have a lot of money to keep it running." So he's like, "Treat it like a car. Turn these things on every six, every six days, and let them run for the day, and then turn them off. Play them for half an hour. Because if they don't, they sit idle and they break." So Putting them in a van is not really, you know, even taking the, <laughs> even taking the Jupiter back from Glasgow when I got it serviced, I was like, I'm concerned that when I take it out of the back of my car wrapped in blankets and cases and everything, it's not going to do the same sound again. It took me a while to get my head around the sample pad thing and not thinking it was cheating. But actually it's like the only thing that goes on that sample pad is the 70 cents that we can't play live strings that we can't play live and a little bit of percussion that lifts choruses and stuff. There's no vocals on it. There's no guitars on it. I've seen bands have vocals on it and guitars on it. That's the pop thing now. It's like the mic's away over the other side of the room in their hand, a meter away and there, the vocal's still coming out. There's none of that, but it allows us to play the album as best as we can with the four of us that we've got. And we don't put everything on it to make some room. It's, it doesn't need to sound exactly the same as the record, but it allows us to present it in a way that's close enough to it. But yeah, I don't really plan to take them live. If we got suddenly got very big, or uh, I would love to have an extra keyboard player to do some of that stuff live and take some stuff. But generally, I play piano, well, it's Nord, play keys, bit of synth, guitar player, Andrew Adams on bass, and he plays bass synth. And then Scott operates the sample pad, the kit, and then the three of us, myself, Adam and Andrew say, and that's the live element taken care of. But a lot of sound for four people to put out. Yeah, I think there's a lot. I think there's enough going on that it's busy and I think it's a good show. And it'd be great to have that luxury of one other person playing some synths, but then you have to get a different van. You have to find the right guy or girl and you got to just get that kind of extra rehearsal done. And it's one other person to consult for availability when you've got an option of a gig. And so, yeah, we've got it down to the four of us and that seems to work as our little team. We've got a sound engineer who comes with us, but yeah. But no, they are amazing things to have. We feel very lucky to have them. And, um, but you not not play live. They don't like hot rooms or cold rooms. And most of the venues <laughs> are sweaty. They want the Goldilocks room. It has to be just right. Yeah, yeah. It's not good. It's not a good idea. When we were first speaking... You told me two things that I think after sitting with them for a little while, I've managed to confuse myself. You are working a little bit more and doing some live work to extend the legs of the current album. Yeah. But you've also started the writing and the demoing for a new project. So I guess my, my question, I, I needed to say it out loud to make sure I understood. And my question is, What's next? Like, what, you know, what are you thinking beyond this current slate of gigs? Do you start recording soon or are you like way, way early? How, do, how does that work? When will we hear some new music? There was two tracks didn't make the cut for the last record that we recorded start to finish that are perfectly fine. They just for long lengths of the album physically. We're talking about putting them out pretty soon, but in terms of new stuff, the room that we've built in Aberdeen, where we live is probably at a point where we could record in it and we'd like to start experimenting with that pretty soon. I would like to try and have enough songs to bring into the band, certainly by the autumn. I mean, I've got probably six that I could sit and play them in some shape or form just now. I'm the kind of person that if I send them two and I get a good reaction, it'll spur me on to, to delve more. I sent them two a few months ago in the WhatsApp group we have and they got missed 
And so no one replied because there was so much chatter in it. And I had it in my head, oh, they hate these tracks. And I thought they were pretty good, <laughs> but no course. one's replied. And then like two weeks later, someone said, oh, I like that stuff you put in. And the other two were like, I didn't even see that. So they went back and they were like into it. So that was a good sign that we've talked about it already. Like I was talking about, obviously some of the stuff I mentioned earlier was a bit downbeat in terms of the content of the lyrics. I want to not do that. I want to make a, not deliberately a party record, but I want it to be, I don't want to sing any more songs about that stuff. I don't want, I don't want to, unless it naturally comes up and it might as a bit of a hangover because it's an ongoing process, but I'd like to make something that people can throw on and enjoy as a kind of, a bit like our live shows, it's a bit more of a punch to it. So then with that in mind, I'm working on stuff already. And I tend to work at these kind of scenarios, like in the evening on my own, go and build the idea, throw it together in some shape or form. And then I'll bring it in and share it. And the guys will then, we then work on it together, we go away and work on it together. And that'll happen for a while. Might have two ideas running at once. Yeah, I'd like to think we could be in the studio by February, March, maybe. Our own studio, that is. The guy we worked with in the last record was amazing, Paul. But I feel like for us, with this new space that we've created, it would make sense for us to try that this time around. So that's our plan. Start of the year is to try and get stuck in. All right, well, I'll look forward to that. And uh, yeah. please keep me posted so that when there's new music, we can share it. Thank you so much for making time. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so no, much. No, right. Thanks for taking an interest in it and for supporting it. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Stephen Milne and the rest of The Little Kicks. As always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On, a production of 23 Media Ventures. I'm your host and executive producer, Lawrence Purrier. We're produced and edited by Michael Donaldson with theme music by Q-Burn's Abstract Message. For past episodes, web-only exclusives, to make a donation to support our production and to join our mailing list, visit us online at spotlightonpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch. Thank you.